So welcome everybody to our 60th semi-annual Texas uh, American College Sports <coughs> Medicine Lecture Series presented by the Department of Kinesiology. Uh, we want to thank everybody for coming and being in attendance. And I also want to give a special thanks to some of our local colleagues and friends from other universities and institutions in the CFW Metro Place who are in attendance as well. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. David Poole. He is a professor and with joint appointments in the Department of Physiology, as well as Anatomy and Physiology from Kansas State University. Um, he's a world-renowned, uh, internationally recognized researcher uh, with a primary focus on mechanisms of uh, pulmonary gas exchange, as well as oxygen transport throughout the circulation and control of the nervous circulation. So I pulled out his CV last week trying to get some of the highlights to, for this introduction. It was 70 pages long. All right, 70 pages, that's a long CV for those of you who don't know. So I'm just going to hit some of the highlights here, and I hope I'm doing you justice. Uh, he's published about 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts and top-tier scientific and clinical journals. He has, in addition to that, he has another 80 publications, uh, invited reviews, as well as editorial pieces. As a PI, he has uh, been awarded over $5 million in grant funds, and then an additional approximately $18 million if you include his uh, funding as a co-op. So for those of you who are relatively new to research, I can tell you that those are some very impressive numbers. And in addition to his research, uh, Dr. Poole also serves as an advisory role on several funding agencies, including the National Institute of Health, He's um, an editor or associate editor for several uh, research journals or clinical journals as well. And lastly, I'll have to use my cheat sheet here, but he's received many awards for his teaching excellence as well at Kansas State University. Most recently, the Myers Alfred Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching Award in 2016, um, as well as the Provost, uh, Kansas State Provost Excellence, uh, Academic Excellence Award in 2015. So I think I said this for our last talk though when I introduced him, but I've seen several of Dr. Poole's talks in the past, and I can assure you who I anticipate being not only informative, but also entertaining at the same time. So if you all can please join me in welcoming Dr. Poole. Thank you, Dr. Brothers. It's fantastic to be here. I always kind of feel, despite my accent, I'm coming home to the the, the base for cardiovascular physiology, particularly during exercise, in sickness and in health. And, and you know, there's so many of my colleagues and friends have uh, been up here before me that it's, it's really a humbling thought. My mentor, Brian Whip, uh, was here a few years ago, Jerry Mitchell, Peter Raven, who's in the audience with us. Um, and I always feel so welcome here, and that's, that's part of it. I like to think of, of science as, as something that appeals to my curiosity but at the same time, it sort of nurtures my, my willingness to be able to talk on a high level with people that I trust, and I really respect you know, where they've put the field and where the field is today. And certainly the group here, Dr. Brothers, Dr. Fidel, Dr. Heikowski, um, uh, amongst several of your faculty, uh, you know, are those close friends and colleagues that uh, I enjoy getting together with. We talk about science, we maybe drink a little too much once in a while, but not too often, but it's... You know, it's, it's all really, really good. Can you hear me at the back okay? Okay. What I'd like you to think about, because my title might not appeal to everybody in this room, or maybe not most of you, what I'd like you to think about is that we have 50, 60, maybe 70 pounds, depending on how big you are, how muscular you are, skeletal muscle in our bodies. The smallest blood vessels in those, the ones that are about a tenth of the thickness of a human hair, support red blood cells going through them. That's delivering oxygen. And that's happening through the close to 10 billion capillaries in our skeletal muscle. When those capillaries don't do their job properly, then we start getting into really severe problems. And one of them is heart failure. And it's a model that I use, I'm going to talk about. It's a disease that cripples the ability to regulate flow and the exchange capacity through those small vessels is completely compromised. And what I would plead to you about is, if you 
know how those vessels work in health, you have a chance at pushing the frontiers of why they don't work properly in disease and dysfunction. And with respect to heart failure, one of the great tragedies is, as with so many conditions, exercise and being physically active is one of the key therapies through many mechanisms, some of which we don't understand at the moment, the key therapies to actually help that patient and decrease their morbidity and extend their lifespan and enjoyment of life. And so we really need to, to understand more about these processes and we know to, and need to know how things work in, in health before we can look at something and say, there's the pathology and go after the root cause. And that's really what my talk is about today. This is the uh, symbol of the uh, Royal Society or the British Physiological Society. It says nullius in verba there. And what that means is the Latin for don't believe what people tell you, see it for yourself. And that's a common theme. I want to show you inside those skeletal muscles. I want to show you what capillaries look like when they're flowing, or capillaries as you might call them. What they look like when they're flowing, what they look like when they're not working properly, and, and look at some of the issues and problems, why that happens. So in, in 1998, Robert Furch got very murdered and Louis Ignoro got the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery that endothelial relaxing factor was really nitric oxide. And we're going to talk a lot about nitric oxide. Um, when I got into the business of understanding blood flow control, we learned that it was very complicated. There were lots of redundant mechanisms. If one failed, other things could kick in. We now know that's not true. We know that if your body, your cells, your muscles don't have enough nitric oxide, things go wrong. Why? This is probably the most complex slide I'll show, and I apologize for showing it. I know you'll get it. But I really just wanted to show you. Here's nitric oxide. Activates um, cyclic GMP here. Activates this myosin light chain phosphatase. And that causes relaxation of smooth muscle. Why is that important? Here's a vessel. This is constricted. Add a little nitric oxide. It opens up. Now blood flow can go to the organ or the skeletal muscle, for example, during exercise. A few years ago, I was invited to a National Institute's um, workshop. And the question that we faced was, how can we improve cardiac rehabilitation in this country? We're not getting the results, the bang, for the tens of billions of dollars for these several million people in heart failure that we're putting on exercise programs. Patients very often discontinue them. They complain to their physician, they're getting tired, and they just don't want to do it. Is there something we can do to make them either more enjoyable, more effective, or keep the patients engaged with it? And so that's a problem that, uh, that we faced, and one that I'm going to come back to in my conclusions. And part of those conclusions will encompass this work. This is Payman Zamani, a rather brilliant Lebanese um, scientist and physician, um, working at the um, at Cardiovascular Institute in the University of Pennsylvania. And he contacted me in, based on some of our basic science work in animals to understand how nitric oxide might be supplemented in heart failure and whether we could now take what we'd learned in animals and put it into humans. Um, senior author here is Julio Chirinos and what we found is that by simply giving the patients about 12 millimoles of beetroot juice or nitrate in beetroot juice, we could modify these class three and four heart failure patients, we could increase their work capacity, their oxygen uptake, decrease their systemic vascular resistance, and raise their cardiac output. And we could do that during maximal exercise in the patients just by, not a drug per se, but by applying the right form of nitrate. And my talk is going to discuss how we got to the stage where we thought it would work in humans, and what I'm saying is that it was efficacious. We went from bench top science to bedside in about four years, which is something quite unusual. A little bit about me. I obviously I don't sound American. Um, I grew up in Wales, although I'm, I'm English by birth, but I grew up in Wales in Snowdonia. Beautiful place. This is Mount Snowdon. It's our highest mountain. It's only three and a half thousand feet, but it's rather beautiful. 
um, beautiful lakes there, nice, nice seaside. You know, a really lovely place to, to grow up, but it, it rains all the time. But why move to Kansas? I mean, you Americans bag a lot on Kansas. It's flat, it's boring and stuff. Why would I go there? Well, growing up in Wales, you have to approach, approach certain pronunciation issues. Has anyone ever been here? This is the longest place name in common usage in the world. And it's a little town on the coast of North Wales. What other people would put four L's in a row? <laughs> the Welsh. And it tells you everything you need to know about the town. There's a couple of churches, there's some beautiful scenery, there's a lovely pond, there's a weeping willow and a, and a red cave up there. All very nice. So it's fun actually to go with Americans back and show them signposts like this and say, how would you pronounce that? A bit cruel, but... So I come to Kansas and I think I live in the hills, I live in the Flint Hills. Manhattan is a lovely little town, university town. Um, and I think tornadoes don't survive in the hills, so it doesn't matter that we're kind of on the edge of Tornado Alley. But a few years ago, this thing came in an EF4. This was it on the outside of town. By the time it got to my house, it was only an EF2. But uh, this was my street. My house is buried under there. This is what Manhattan looked like. Took about 40 houses out. And I was humbled because I thought we were safe. Now, when I hear the, uh, the tornado warnings, I realize, poof, you know, maybe not so much fun. It took us about 10 days with uh, a chainsaws to get down my street and so I could get my car out of the house. And the house wasn't destroyed, just missing parts of a roof and stuff. So, so nothing major. So interested, as I said, I'm in very interested in the pathway for oxygen going from the atmosphere all the way through tens of thousands of miles of blood vessels, in muscles, arteries, arterioles, Arterials have this endoth uh, endothelium. This is where the site of blood flow control, particularly to muscle, is. And one of the key places we want to look where we think about dysfunction. But we also not only want to think about flow through here, but we want to think about what controls red blood cell flux, oxygen delivery through the capillaries. And these are capillaries. These aren't the capillaries that I learned about when I was at your stage in university. I learned they were straight, unbranched structures, but they're not. They've got a really interesting structure. They've got tortuosity, and they have a really interesting flow profile. And we'll talk about that. So we need to know something about what capillaries look like, what their flow profile is, and if we're going to understand how red cells distribute in them and how we get oxygen into the mitochondria so we can actually fund with ATP aerobically on muscle work. And that's, remember, a key issue that heart failure patients have a huge, huge problem with. Being at Kansas State, I've had the chance to work with a range of different animal models. Um, the one on the right is the elephant here. This is me as a slightly younger man. Elephants are amazing creatures. This is Jewel, four and a half tons of love. Um, we got to ask questions about why horses blow their lungs out when they run, and this is overt epistaxis in horses. But our real raison d'etre is, is to understand the range of human performance from the exceptional Paula Radcliffe, the world record holder uh, for women in the marathon, um, down to the heart failure patients and how we can do something, maybe using some of the information learned at this level to benefit their um, health, vitality, and future. I'm privileged to be able to uh, jump on planes and go and work with folks I really enjoy around the world um, to attack these problems at different levels. Um, here's just an example of, of that behavior. This is um, Ilka Heinonen in Turku in Finland. It uses uh, positron emission tomography to measure blood flow and oxygen matching in, in human muscles. Yutaka Kano in uh, University of Tokyo, <coughs> Professor Kano, is teaching us about calcium and things that we didn't know, how the mitochondria have a superb role in sequestering calcium in health and disease. This fellow, Shinsaku Koga, went to Hamamatsu and said, we want to be able to see inside human muscle, not just the surface layers of muscle, but deep down how human muscle works. And they developed a near-infrared spectrometer that can look at oxygenation four or five centimeters, two inches deep in muscle. We've learned a lot about nitrate and nitrite um, supplementation from uh, Jason Allen, who's now down in Australia. We use that to inform us about critical power and human performance with Andy Jones, Annie Vanatalo, Mark Burnley in the University of Exeter and Kent. And 
comes full circle to put that knowledge back inside these patients with uh, Zamani and Chirinos. We've also got a strong interest now as talking to Dr. Um, uh, Brothers uh, uh, and Dr. Andrews, for example, um, about what some of these techniques can do with brain blood flow. They're much more expert than I am, but I'm an expert in kinetics. I want to understand how things change. For example, when you start exercising, your body increases the oxygen uptake eight or ten times. How does it do that? What's the control of that process? How can that inform us when patients can't do that? or well, they can't do it as well. So here's the outline of my talk. We'll talk about heart failure, problem of oxygen transport very briefly. We'll look at observations down at that capillary level, this nullius in verba. See it for yourself. See if, if I can convince you that something very strange happens in capillaries <laughs> that isn't what we necessarily teach or are taught in school. <clears throat> we'll look at lessons from animal research, how it can inform human research. We'll talk about nitric oxide and then we'll have some conclusions. So heart failure can come from many, many different causes. Okay, we, the model that we use is that we, in a, a rat preparation, we actually tie off the left anterior uh, vessel in rats, this portion of the heart tissue dies. It's like a human having a myocardial infarction. This tissue becomes necrotic. This is the left ventricle, the cross section three. All this tissue is necrotic and dead. And the bottom line is this heart now will not pump. So this, the individual with this heart went from controlling their cardiac output, what the heart is putting out and delivering oxygen to the body, controlling that to controlling blood pressure. And a whole host of things happen, including very poor blood flow to skeletal muscle. So heart failure is a failure to pump blood and maintain cardiac output. How do we get from young and healthy to heart failure? Well, aging is part of the process. Here's the maximum oxygen uptake uh, during large muscle mass exercise. And you can see with age, this is inexorably goes down. But you can actually, with training, keep this a little higher. But it will go down with age. So these are healthy folks aging. But here's heart failure. Carl Weber's classification. This will be New York Heart Association, class one, two, three, and four, respectively. And the way we categorize the severity of heart failure very often is in this maximal oxygen uptake. How much oxygen can be uptaken, transported through the body, and used by the muscles during maximal exercise? And look at these levels in certainly class three and four heart failure, barely above the resting levels. How can we help these patients? Not just the maximal capacity to use oxygen. You might say, well, you know, particularly patients or most of us, you know, particularly as we get in our 30s and 40s, we, we don't perform a lot of maximal exercise. We don't go to maximal oxygen uptake. But every time we get up from a seat or we start walking around, we have a metabolic transition. And our body has to respond to that. Cardiac output goes up, oxygen goes to our tissues, mitochondria use that oxygen and make energy. And that process is fundamentally impaired in heart failure. So at the onset of exercise here, cycling or walking on a treadmill, those are healthy kinetics. They're very rapid. Those are very slow kinetics. This is class three heart failure. Low maximal oxygen uptake, slow kinetics. So why is that important? Well, here's this healthy individual. And this blue shaded area is something called the oxygen deficit. That's oxygen that the individual, the muscles, would like to have used, but they couldn't because the mitochondria couldn't speed up quick enough. So they had to use anaerobic energy sources. And we can quantify that as in terms of the oxygen deficit. Here it's about a litre. And that's a reasonable profile for a young, healthy individual. But here's someone with heart failure, for example. <coughs> Look how slow that is. This hatched area is much bigger. And their oxygen deficit is now twice as high. So if we took a muscle sample, they've got decreased their phosphocreatine inside the muscle, their free ADP is higher, inorganic phosphate is higher, glycolysis is proceeding more rapidly, they're using their carbohydrate glycogen reserves, and their exercise tolerance is compromised. If you have slow kinetics, some of these activities you will not be able to do. Your enjoyment of life, 
even if you're a pet. Not so much. Not so much. So how can we help these patients? Let's think about the oxygen cascade. So if we go from the air and we look at the pressure and the values, the absolute values aren't important, but you can see that um, oxygen goes from a region of high pressure in the air around us down to its lowest level, which is in uh, muscle in the mitochondria uh, and surrounding the mitochondria, actually in the exercising muscle during exercise, very, very low value. This is the oxygen cascade. We look in healthy individuals and then roll forward to heart failure. We can see here mean capillary oxygen pressure is much, much lower. These values might not change too much, but the signal from healthy to heart failure is being transduced at the level of the microcirculation inside those capillaries. It might not be the cause, but it's where you see the signal, and it's what is impacting our ability to get oxygen to the tissues. So if we have these slow kinetics here, work capacity is very low, as Harry Rossiter showed in a recent review. We can form a hypothesis, the basis for science research. Impaired VO2 kinetics, muscle dysfunction in heart failure, chronic heart failure, results primarily from altered muscle blood flow control and microcirculatory dysfunction. There's a problem with perfusion, blood flow, bulk oxygen delivery. The arterioles aren't working properly. There may be some endothelial dysfunction. These are the layers of smooth muscle and endothelial cells that line our arterioles, which are the gatekeepers for muscle blood flow. And there'll be some endothelial function. These cells respond to being rubbed um, by red blood cells and can release vasodilating factors <coughs> such as nitric oxide. We can examine this function in isolated vessels, as uh, Dr. Mike Delp, who was a previous speaker in this series, um, uh, has made a living from with uh, Dr. Brad Binky. We can study the capillary bed, how well it's perfused, and we can also ask how are the diffusional properties of that muscle for oxygen changed? So we don't have a carrier to get from a red cell here to the muscle mitochondria or the tissue mitochondria. This process is driven by a pressure difference for oxygen from here to here. And so this is that capillary or microvascular pressure we talked about that becomes so low in heart failure. Why does it become low and how can we correct that? So let's go down to the capillary level. So these are a couple of scientists chatting about these processes. And one says, well, I think it should be more explicit here in step two. Then a miracle occurs. Sometimes when things are difficult to look at, people don't look at them, and they like to talk about them and look at them. It's like, what's the definition of a classic in literature? Something everyone talks about, but nobody reads. So people talk about microcirculation, because it's where all the oxygen is transferred um, uh, uh, in muscle, but not many people measure it. They have this input and output, and it's really a black box. We want to talk about it but we don't want to look at it if it's difficult. So let's open that black box. And it's true that sometimes size conveys perspective. Sometimes not. Interesting. He looks pretty happy. This maybe wasn't taken yesterday. Maybe this was. <laughs> But often, research, the outcome is predicated by the perception. And there's a wonderful book called The Discoverers, written by Daniel J. Boston, the old, um, or the previous Librarian of Congress. And it said that the greatest, he said, that the greatest impediment to scientific progress is not ignorance, but the false illusion of knowledge. And that can be true. If you read Voltaire's Candide, Dr. Pangloss said, in the best of all possible worlds, there's no place for inconvenient truths. Or is there? So this is one of my heroes in science, August Krogh, Nobel laureate in 1919. He's uh, from uh, uh, just outside um, uh, Copenhagen. He's Danish. And he is, uh, um, one of his discoveries was that we recruit capillaries from rest to exercise. 
So the popular perception is now, and what's taught around the world in medical schools, is that in resting muscle, most capillaries are stagnant. As the muscle begins rhythmic contractions, red blood cell flux is initiated in previously stagnant capillaries. And we use this, it's a simple, easily understood concept to explain increased blood myocyte delivery for oxygen, free fatty acid, glucose, reduced diffusion distances from capillaries to mitochondria and distant fibers maybe, increased fractional total oxygen extraction across an exercising muscle. But is it correct? So here's what a diaphragm looks like. This is real muscle, fibers go this way. Look at these red cells going down the capillaries. All these capillaries, 90% or so, are flowing. This is muscle at rest. It's not supposed to happen. I was told this didn't happen. I looked down a microscope and I saw it happening. You know, I was a young postdoctoral fellow and you know, it didn't agree with anything. And I had this dogma inside my mind, but I'd seen something different. Was it right? Had I screwed up the preparation? Had I done something fundamentally wrong? That's what a lot of people told me. But the more tissue we looked at, the more preparations we examined, we corrected anesthesia, we, we did everything we could to be sure about it. And what we came to was the conclusion that capillary recruitment doesn't happen, not much. And yet, this is the predominant theory for explaining microvascular oxygen exchange, going from rest to exercise. So, why would I say this? Well, you've seen some film, nullius in verba, you've seen it for yourself. So we've got intravital microscopy evidence. We've got data from diverse approaches. When you use near-infrared spectroscopy, like Professor Koga and, and, and many folks uh, uh, here do, Dr. Brothers does in the brain and other people here, what it does, it gives you a window to look in and see the hemoglobin concentration inside tissues. When you look at muscle, if you follow the logic that we've got all these blood vessels, capillaries, that don't flow at rest, but suddenly start flowing during exercise, you'd now expect to see this huge increase in the hemoglobin concentration or the red blood cell concentration going from rest to exercise. And you don't see that. You see a 20 to 30% increase, and I'll tell you why you do see that. But there's no evidence in intact humans from rest to exercise that you are recruiting all these capillaries. So is our understanding of capillary function completely defunct? I would say possibly. You've got to have putative explanations for con uh, contrary data. When I debate this issue, that's where we go. You've got to have an alternative model based upon the data, and we do. We now have a model for capillary function that if we believed in capillary recruitment, we could never have got. And of course, there are degrees of uncertainty that we have to mention as ethical scientists. So here's a preparation we use. This is the work of Janet Bailey uh, in our laboratory. This is a small muscle. It stabilizes the scapula. It's called the spinotrapezius muscle. It's a good analog of human muscle. It has the same fiber types. Um, but it's thin, so we can actually transilluminate it. We can create this preparation. We can uh, look at it microscopically. We can keep the nervous supply and the vascular supply intact, and we can understand a little about muscle function using this preparation. Here's what this muscle looks like. This is some film uh, from almost 20 years ago now. Made us very excited. This is a doctoral student, Casey Kindig, and my colleague, Tim Mush. Again, you can see most of these capillaries are flowing. Here's a collecting venule. These are the muscle fibers. Here's an arterial supplying that capillary and that capillary. Look how fast this seems to be. It's only about a quarter of a millimeter a second, actually, on average. But most of the capillaries are flowing. This is healthy muscle. Now, we'll give that animal heart failure. We'll have another animal that's had myocardial infarction and is in heart failure. Fibers are running north-south this time. Look at this capillary here. It's not flowing, this one's flowing slowly, not flowing, red cells stuck there, not flowing, low hematocrit, very, very low flow. This is muscle in heart failure. This is the muscle, we believe, that's in a patient who says, look, I can't do the cardiac rehab. I walked on a treadmill for 20 minutes last week and I'm still stiff, I'm sore. These muscle fibers that aren't getting flow, they're uh, producing compounds, they're building up a very high oxygen deficit. Um, they've got very, very um, low levels of phosphocreatine and this may be where some of the pain and certainly the exercise intolerance is originating. If we can get those capillaries to flow, maybe we can help these patients. Here's our model based on, on uh, those studies of capillary function, where you don't have to recruit more capillaries. They flow all the time. 
but going from rest to exercise, the hematocrit, the number of red cells per capillary, goes up about threefold. Capillaries that were very slow at rest get faster and become important for exchange. You now recruit surface area as you now exchange oxygen far further down the capillary than you did at rest. So you've recruited this um, uh, capillary surface area for exchange. We now also appreciate that this f little fuzzy coating on the inside of a capillary called an endothelial surface layer or glycocalyx that enables us to have red cells that zip along much faster than the plasma. Plasma gets stuck in these. So there's some really interesting behavior with this glycocalyx. And also we're increasing the um, gradient from capillary to the myocyte by lowering intramyocyte oxygen pressure, for example. So all of these things can explain everything we used to explain with capillary recruitment. And this idea of how capillaries work has been featured in Journal Applied Physiology, um, uh, uh, other, uh, the uh, Act of Physiology of Scandinavica, these journals. We've debated it on major stages, and um, uh, I'd say the evidence is, is as convincing as it can be. And if you understand this, you now have the basis for understanding heart failure, why things aren't working so well. Otherwise, you might see those capillaries that didn't flow in the heart failure animal and say, ah, it's normal. That's what we expected to see. It isn't. So here's a healthy animal. This is oxygen uptake, VO2 maximal oxygen uptake. This is the, a backwards oxygen dissociation curve. And I normally call this the Wagner diagram after the great Peter Wagner who conceived it initially. Um, this is perfusive oxygen delivery. This is microvascular oxygen pressure. And all I want you to do is appreciate that that point there, that VO2 max in a healthy individual comes from having a certain perfusive oxygen delivery to the tissue and a diffusing capacity that's given to by the slope of this line. In heart failure, you've decreased the perfusive, the oxygen flow to the muscle, the blood flow, and you've also lowered the slope of this line. If we're going to make muscle and heart failure work better, we have to improve this point here. Anywhere north of here will help. It will help the kinetics and VO2 max. It will help the patient perform better. And we have to do that by raising perfusion back up this way and diffusion by steepening that slope. How can we do it? So we've written a couple of reviews on this that uh, uh, Dr. Brothers very kindly mentioned. And we posed some key questions. So how skeletal muscle blood flow distribution during exercise affected by heart failure? How does this impact blood myocyte O2 flux <coughs> and metabolic control? What are the mechanisms? And how can we reverse this dysfunction? Well, here's what it looks like in heart failure. There's a patient with heart failure. The diaphragm gets more flow because sometimes they have uh, blood core pulmonal. The lungs are a bit soggy, so they, the diaphragm blood flow goes up. But the gut blood flow, many other organ blood flow, and particularly skeletal muscle, is low and it's compromised. It's a very complicated condition. There's the immune system um, uh, dysfunction and many other uh, sides to this. But the bottom line is skeletal muscle blood flow that if it was better, they could do more exercise, would be therapeutic for their condition, um, but that's the problem, they can't. And what that's doing is, it's lowering this oxygen pressure in the microcirculation so that they can't effectively get oxygen into the, the myocytes. And we'll look at the evidence for that from animal work. This is how it translates. So we've got low cardiac output, low muscle blood flow, perfusive delivery. If we look at the structure, folks got very excited. They can measure, take a biopsy and say, well, there are fewer capillaries. But there aren't many fewer in skeletal muscle and heart failure. There's, they lose a few. But the big deal is, as I showed you in that film, that many of them, they don't flow. They don't maintain normal flux. There's 40 or 50 or 60% deficit in their red blood cell oxygen transport. So if you look at the muscle at rest, the oxygen pressure in it is very low, much lower than control here. When you stimulate that muscle, when you contract it, <coughs> look how low the oxygen pressure in the microcirculation goes. And that's the pressure that has to drive the oxygen into the tissue. So the kinetics get slower. You're in this oxygen delivery dependent region here. You've got very slow kinetics. 
um, your mitochondria start up very slowly, if you will, and your oxygen um, utilizing capability and your ability to do exercise is down at this point. This is very, very low. This is critical power. This is um, COPD, lung patients, and also class three heart failure. That work rate of this so-called critical power exercise level is not high enough to allow you to walk up a flight of stairs or carry groceries to the car from the supermarket. Things that are very important to quality of your life, for example. So how can we improve this? Well, you can run some rats on treadmills. We can create a myocardial infarction. That's what it looks like in vivo in a, in a rat that's had its left uh, 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 coronary artery ligated. This is when you open up the ventricle and look at it, shine a light through it. This is all dead tissue. That's what a healthy heart looks like. That's a heart with heart failure. This is why the heart can't pump. This is Tim Mush's work. How do we measure blood flow in small animals? We can infuse something called radioactive microsphere. They're 15 microns. They stick in the arterioles. And they enable us to measure blood flow during exercise and at rest in different muscles comprised of different fiber types. You can see a nice red muscle. Um, this is um, highly oxidative, um, part of the vastus lateralis. This is the white portion. Type 2 fast twitch fibers. This is an intermediate. Same for the gastrocnemius. So we can run rats on treadmills, healthy and with heart failure, and we can ask, what's changed? This is the work again from my, my colleague, Dr. Mush and, and, uh, and uh, John Terrell. And what this shows, this is delta blood flow, is that heart failure compromises most severely blood flow to the highly oxidative red muscles in the body. Okay? So there's a higher resistance, lower blood flow. This creates a huge compromise to exercise. So microscopy and movement don't go together. But Casey Kindig, when he was in our lab, Dr. Kindig, figured out a way to actually follow these movements of contractions while you could still see the red cells. And it's, it's been blown up 17,000 times here. So this obviously is, is a little less clear than we'd like, but it's much clearer on a TV screen. But in between contractions, you can actually measure using frame by frame and computer techniques where the red cells are going in this muscle, what the distribution is, what is flowing, and what isn't flowing. So here's what it looks like. When we analyze film like that, we look at the onset of contractions like you just saw at one hertz, like a human cycling, and we look at the red cell flux in the capillaries. It increases rapidly at the onset of contractions, plateaus out here in health, but in heart failure, not so much. This is very, very slow. This is the, what we believe underlies those very slow kinetics at the onset of exercise in humans, for example. Low blood flow and oxygen delivery for a given metabolic rate. Low pressure of oxygen driving to the mitochondria. And here's what it looks like when we actually use the phosphorescent probe and we look at oxygen deep down in the microcirculation, control heart failure. Look how low that driving pressure here is. It's the work of Emily Diederich in the lab. Can we correct it acutely? Yes. We can give an, excuse me, we can give um, an animal in moderate heart failure sodium nitroprusside, a source of nitric oxide, and we can change this low profile to a much better one. So it's not a structural change predominantly, it's a functional change. Alberto Nader gave sildenafil, Viagra, to some patients who were well managed therapeutically and what he showed was that the onset of exercise here, this is the control, and this is the deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin deep within the muscle, the excising leg muscles. This is on sildenafil, Viagra here. So this is an increase in muscle oxygenation. Did it improve kinetics? So decreased deoxygenation, increased oxygenation. This is their oxygen uptake profile, control on sildenafil Viagra. Speeded it, but the most important consequence of this was increased exercise tolerance. So these patients could now do 20% more work. Huge deal. 
changed their lives immensely. So let's follow that nitric oxide story. Now, vascular control is a complex business. There's lots of things going on. And I'll have to ask you to accept that. But we're interested in control of blood flow, which is decreased in these patients. And we're going to focus purely on nitric oxide. And we know that nitric oxide, a major, major function of it, is this vasodilation. It also does many things that we won't go into today. But it causes vasodilation. Okay? But... In heart failure, the two endogenous enzyme or constitutive enzymes, ENOS and ENOS, are downregulated. They normally produce nitric oxide. They're downregulated, or the nitric oxide is removed by free radicals in this inflammatory heart failure condition. So, can we give them nitrate? And can you biologically reduce nitrate to nitrite to nitric oxide and use it? We didn't used to think you could. But over the last 15 to 17 years, there's an appreciation now that salivary glands concentrate nitrate that we eat. So here's my little student did this for me, Dr. Ferguson. You eat nitrate, it's absorbed in the stomach, and you can do it in the form of beetroot juice or potassium nitrate. That goes in the bloodstream to the salivary glands. It's secreted into the mouth. Uh, sorry, that was a bit early. Let's go back up there. Secreted into the mouth. These um, uh, bacteria in the mouth, Actinomyces, Rothia, and others, reduce it from nitrate to nitrite. It's reabsorbed. Nitrite is then high in the bloodstream. And deoxygenated hemoglobin in areas of low oxygenation, like the muscles of a heart failure patient when they're trying to exercise, um, this um, becomes reduced to nitric oxide. And that nitric oxide may vasodilate the very parts of the body that have pathologically low flow. Let's try it in health and see if it does it. Um, uh, in healthy individuals, yes, it does. This is rats, Dr. Scott Ferguson's work. Blood flow has increased about 40% after they've taken a few millimoles of nitrate every day for five days and then run on treadmill. And that blood flow goes to their fast twitch muscle fibers, preferentially. So if you're sending more blood flow, you should increase the oxygen pressure down there. And so, um, again, Dr. Ferguson showed that the nitrate enables a higher oxygen pressure in fast twitch muscle fibers. If you're a heart failure patient, you recruit these fibers at very low levels of exercise. So this was a pretty exciting finding. Not so exciting in slow twitch fibers, not as much. Fast twitch fiber seems to be targeted for this nitric oxide effect. Okay, what about heart failure where they don't have as much nitric oxide available? Same effect. Nitrate supplementation via beetroot juice in heart, hearts in, of, uh, in sorry in rats with a large myocardial infarction increases blood flow by elevating vascular conductors, opening up the vessels. So this is not as clear as the other, but just bear with me a second here. This is an animal in heart failure without nitric oxide. There are red cells stuck in the capillaries here, not flowing in here. It's hard to see, and I apologize for that, stuck in here. About 40 to 50% of these capillaries here and here and here aren't flowing. Now we put the, the rat on beetroot juice for five days. 80, 90%, just like control, healthy muscle, most of this is flowing. This is preliminary data. We've got four animals in each group, but it's looking extremely positive. So heart failure uh, lowers the proportion of capillaries that flow, down here from 80 something percent to 60, depending on the degree. Placebo. We take the nitrate out of beetroot juice, doesn't change things. We put the nitrate back into beetroot juice, and look at that. So not only are we increasing perfusion and oxygen delivery to the muscle, we're increasing the ability of capillaries to flow, improving diffusion capacity, and allowing that oxygen to be utilized. And there's the evidence for this effect. Contracting muscle at the onset of contractions 
very low oxygen pressures at the onset of contractions um, in heart failure with beetroot juice, with nitrate supplementation. And there's no difference in the extent of heart failure between these animals and these animals. And yet the beetroot juice completely modifies this. So what have we done? Last slide. Thank you for your patience. We've got VO2 max here in a healthy animal. This is our perfusion line. This is the slope of diffusion. Heart failure patients are down here. Very low VO2 max. May not enable them to be a part of society or interact with their family. Okay. If the beetroot juice had just increased oxygen delivery by flow, increasing flow, they go to here for VO2 max. But because we can get more capillaries to flow, as I just showed you in the heart failure with beetroot juice, they go to this point here, substantially higher increase in VO2 max. And for every little increment in VO2 max, their morbidity and mortality, their readmission to hospital goes down. And uh, so this is very, very exciting uh, uh, for us. And the fact that diffusing capacities are altered. And that's the basis behind the circulation paper where um, Dr. Uh, Zamani and Chirinos uh, and our team actually managed to put that science from the rats into people. Why does the, the beetroot juice nitrate work so well? It works so well, we think, in heart failure. It increases that VO2 max 10%, which is a big deal for them. It increases their work capacity. It does it so well because it vasodilates the muscle. And because the oxygen pressures are so low in contracting muscle of heart failure patients, that reduces the nitrites to nitrate, to NO, far more easily, to nitric oxide, far more easily. And so it's not like you vasodilated the whole body on these patients because then they couldn't raise the cardiac output and sustain mean arterial pressure. That's not what it's doing. It's a focused delivery of nitrite to nit NO within the muscles where they need it. And this has amazing potential for the six million or more individuals in this country and, and, and more worldwide that are in heart failure. Okay? The folks that are becoming very, very uh, disillusioned with their rehabilitation programs because they're becoming stiff uh, and they don't recover very easily or the exercise is, is punishingly hard for them. And some of these folks have been very sedentary most of their lives. We're asking them, now they feel worse than ever, to do exercise that they've avoided like the plague before. Um, but the, we're now exploring, obviously, in many, many scenarios. Dr. Mark Kowski is an expert in this area, looking at which patient populations are best impacted by this, uh, this uh, therapy. And uh, takes a village. There's my village. Amazing group of individuals. And I would thank you. Any questions? Ten minutes or so. Dr. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is recovery. So when a heart failure patient um, has exercised and you look at their recovery kinetics, they take a long time to recover. Uh, and in fact, that's the most consistent signal very often, as you, and Dr. Haykowski is very aware. It's, it's easier to model things when patients aren't exercising. So when they stop exercising, you see these downslopes, but they take a long, long time to recover their oxygen uptake. And part of that is a low perfusion. And we think, we haven't tested it yet, but we can't imagine that these muscles on nitrate will not benefit and improve their off kinetics. And because so much activity is phasic, because so many, you know, folks, it's not, you know, for young healthy people, uh, you know, a, a soccer or football match, you know, they, they start up and they slow down and you can accumulate fatigue. Much, much worse, as you're aware, in patients. And so the potential for faster recovery certainly is there. And we haven't tested it. And I'm, I'm guessing you probably are at some point going to look at that. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I can't imagine um, that it won't, but I would expect the biggest signal where the exercise before beetroot juice is in the severe domain and it now is heavy or moderate intensity with a lower level of uh, acidosis um, now because they've increased their exercise capacity. I think you get a lovely signal. Uh, Um, I, I'd, love, I'd love to see those high-intensity um, small muscle mass training sessions done. You know, um, I, I think that'd be a beautiful study. We, we haven't done that. Yes? Did you use the study for the Yeah, that, that's a great question. Why, why wouldn't we just use potassium nitrate? Um, it, it sounded horrible to the, uh, the investigative body. So well, to do research at university, you probably know, we have to go through an institutional review board. And we said we were interested in giving potassium nitrate, but now nitrates have been associated with cancers, high nitrates. So that didn't sound very good, but we're going to give them beetroot juice. That sounded fantastic to the people. So then we got in, we gave beetroot juice, and we find we've got these beneficial effects. But then they said, well, here's all the antioxidants that are there. And so now we use a very careful placebo control where we take out the nitrate using a very fine filter system, but we leave the antioxidants. And the antioxidants aren't doing anything in this situation. There's just not enough of them or whatever. They're not benefiting things. It's the, it's the nitrate itself. So the main difference, there really isn't one of the really the higher And now we're, we're beyond all that. Now, now some of the, the clinicians who were... Uh, and scientists that were stuck in the nitrate is bad, it will perform met hemoglobin, it will promote cancer, um, you know, they're, they're persuaded now that we're, we're not giving those kind of doses. And in fact, in, in beetroot juice, it's, it's difficult to conceive of getting anywhere close to the dose. We give now, in our latest uh, study with Zamani, we've got 18 millimoles of, of nitrate per day. Uh, and that's about 300 grams of arugula, for example. So if you wanted three kilos of arugula, you might start getting to the levels where we worry about toxic effects, but it's difficult to OD on beetroot juice. Plus, it doesn't taste that good, to be quite honest, but they, they now have a little condensed supplement that actually tastes really good. So, and it's about 50 mils, so it's, it's not very, very big. So it's, it's something pleasant for people. They can maybe hark back to when their parents said, you know, vegetables are good for you. And then folks in Britain would say, well, I eat beets all the time. But the way we eat them in Britain, we tend to, and Dr. Raven can, can attest to this, is we put them in vinegar and it, it, it leaches out the nitrate. Unless you drink the juice, you're not getting the benefit. It has to be the beetroot um, with the nitrate. Do you see a way of doing that is going towards the No, no, uh, um, I, I would, I mean, you know, the, the whole issue with doping, I think it's going to come. I think the IOC and the uh, anti-doping WADA is going to get on the, the nitrate story. They're already discussing it. There are grants going out there to look at this, you know, from their perspective. Nike is studying it in Oregon. Uh, beetroot juice with Dr. Jones is out there, Andy Jones. Um, so, um, you know, I know that it's just as effective in patients um, in the ongoing study that we have of uh, dose response in patients. We're using potassium nitrate pills. Um, with the same dosing, and it's having, it's, it's having the same effect. Great question, thank you. Yes? Yeah, so the, the, the question's, uh, again, a very, very good one. It's if you use uh, Listerine or something, does it kill these bacteria to an extent where you don't get this effect? And uh, there's some recent studies, again, from Andy Jones and Lee Wiley's uh, lab, where they show that Listerine kills about 50% of them and reduces the effect by about half. To take away the effect entirely, you have to use something that we've never put in our mouth in this country. You know, it's like pure hydrogen peroxide, but they use it in Northern Europe sometimes. I guess they're tough folks there. And that's, well, that will kill these things for hours. But you can reduce the effect, but it doesn't take it away. But toothpaste doesn't do it. But Listerine will. Half. Half the effect. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Um, so after supplementation, what changes are you seeing in the level of Hey, so 
in terms of its ability to produce nitric oxide. Okay, so... The question is, um, have we looked at the arterioles and seen how they're producing endogenous nitric oxide uh, from um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase? And, you know, it's, it's a really great question. No, we, we haven't, in fact. Um, you know, because these heart failure patients, they're still in a pro-inflammatory condition. The free radicals um, superoxide is still high, and it will be taking out some of the, um, uh, the NO and converting it to peroxynitrite. But... We don't see a huge increase in that behavior. What we're not seeing is a, a, you know, a huge spike in peroxynitrite, which might be harmful. Um, we don't know exactly why we're not seeing that, but we don't see that typically. And it may be that the antioxidants you know, in beetroot juice would, would help you know, curb that effect. Um, if they're chronically on this, will it impair the um, endothelial uh, uh, NO to respond to exercise training, for example? That is a great question, and we don't know the answer to that. You know, we know you can block a lot of the training benefits from, uh, you know, um, uh, harsh antioxidant therapy. Um, but whether the, the beetroot will do that, we don't know. Uh, and that's a key question if we're going to put it into heart failure patients in cardiac rehab. You know, and those, those studies will actually address those exact questions. It's very important. Yes. We, we haven't looked there. We haven't been able to, uh, to look there. Um, what we are seeing, though, is that the filling pressures for the heart, so when the heart doesn't fill properly, the kidney gets really, really jealous. And it says, OK, you know, we'll, we'll have this massive vasoconstriction. We'll retain fluid volume. And that's why you know, these patients are on diuretics, to, to lower their vascular volume. So the, the heart itself has this high filling pressure necessary to generate any cardiac output at all. Um, and what we do find is that for a given amount of um, damage to the heart, the filling pressure is less. So the heart actually is working less hard to generate a given cardiac output. And that may be a very, very good effect. The subendocardium in the healthy heart probably has better flow and flow dynamics. Um, with the human um, patients with uh, Payman's Amani, what we see is that the signal is manifest, the increase in, in flow by a decreased systemic vascular resistance. And so the heart seems to be doing about the same amount of work, but generating more flow with that. And, you know, I would suspect, I would imagine that it, it is good for the heart having lower filling pressures, better flow in diastole for the healthy parts of the heart. But, you know, we haven't been able to go there. 